All right. Uh, how many of you glad to be here? Amen? What a blessing it is to be together with so many friends and family. We are family in the Lord. Amen? And uh, when we gather for events like this, uh, it is like a family reunion. And it's the best family reunion I've ever been to. I've been to some other real family reunions uh, that were a total disaster and train wreck. But this, this family of God reunion that we do uh, conferences like this are truly a time that are blessed of the Lord, and it's a joy to be here with you. Amen. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and if you don't have a Bible this morning, uh, use your app or, or uh, just sit back and listen, but 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, is where we're going to be uh, starting this morning. And uh, uh, later on in the talk or message this morning, I'm going to invite you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you're ambidextrous and uh, want to get ahead of the curve this morning, you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as well. But we're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and it is a short passage that I'm going to be uh, starting with and preaching off of this morning. And so because it is a short passage, I'm going to invite you to stand with me uh, as we read the Word of God this morning. First Timothy chapter 3, and starting in verse 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and support of the truth. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would speak to our hearts today, Lord, not only through the words that I'm communicating today, but through every speaker uh, that will be following me today, tonight, tomorrow, and for the rest of the conference. Lord, we open up our hearts to hear from you. Give us ears to hear today what your spirit is saying to each one of us at every place and position that you've placed us. Lord, you've called us into the ministry. You've called us out of the world. You've called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Lord, you've sent us out, Lord, to be ministers of the gospel. Lord, help us uh, as we spend time together, as we've, we've pulled away over the next few days. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to be encouraged by your word. We want to be filled uh, anew with a sense of uh, awe and wonder at who you are and how you are working through us in the world today that your name would be exalted, the name above every name. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Uh, for this first session today, I want to, it to serve as an introduction for the rest of the morning sessions. The rest of the morning sessions that will be today, there'll be three more today, and there'll be four more tomorrow. And I want to use my time to explain the heart behind uh, the topics that we've uh, picked for our morning sessions. Over the last two centuries or so, the last 200 years or so, give or take, there have been roughly two main attempts to save, I say quote unquote, save Christianity. Two main attempts or two main thrusts to try to save Christianity. The first is one that we wholeheartedly reject on its surface. It's a no-go. It's a non-starter for us. And the second, I have a concern that we may be adopting and, and accepting some of that attempt to save Christianity. The problem with these attempts to save Christianity is you're trying to save something that doesn't need to be saved. Christianity already has a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He's seated on a throne, and he doesn't need anybody helping him to build his church. And so any attempt to try to fix or to save Christianity, though the intent may be good, it is ultimately misguided and will in fact end up working against the very aim of the Christian faith. And so the, 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 these two categories, again, I said the first we reject uh, wholeheartedly, and that is theological liberalism. Theological liberalism. And this ideology, this idea, says that the message is keeping people away from the church. That the message of the gospel, that, that people don't like the message, 
So how do we save the church? How do we save the faith when people don't like the message? And so theological liberalism, what it tries to do is to save Christianity by changing the message. And so if people don't like the message, well, we'll, we'll just change it. We'll just alter it. We'll just adjust it. And so things like the incarnation, well, that's got to go. God becoming a man, that's kind of ridiculous. The virgin birth, we'll, we'll get rid of that. Atonement, well, people don't really like the idea of, of God uh, uh, being wrathful against sin and him, him, Jesus taking the wrath of God. That, that, that sounds kind of violent, and, and so we'll, we'll do away with the atonement. Instead, we'll, we'll replace Jesus dying on the cross as him showing the ultimate act of selflessness, and, and that's what all that it is on the cross. So the atonement goes. Well, the resurrection, the bodily resurrection, no, that's got to go too because... Uh, we don't believe in miracles anymore in this sort of enlightenment era and scientific age. And then ultimately, sin itself is ejected from theological liberalism. The liberals and, theolo and I, again, I'm not talking politics this morning. I'm not using that term politically. I'm using that term theologically. Liberals in theological circles say, well, we don't know if there's really a heaven or a hell. But we'll sort of take some of the principles of religion and we'll give them to you to help you along your way, to help you feel good about your state in life. We don't know about eternity. We don't know how, what happens when you die. But we'll help your time here on earth. We'll, we'll make the ride through life comfortable using some sort of religious principles and terminology. Now again, as I said, all of us here reject this wholeheartedly, categorically. We see the, the obviousness of this error. If you hollow out the message of the gospel, you're not left with a more palatable version of Christianity. You're not left with Christianity at all. When you, when you start to strip away these essential and central parts of the Christian faith... You're left with something altogether different, something that is not true at all, but rather is false. You end up with a form of religion while denying its power. Because we know that the gospel alone is the power of God unto salvation. And so we see this. We see people that deny these essential Christian doctrines, and we say, no, we reject that. We believe the word of God. Amen. But the, the, the second attempt, if you will, to save Christianity is more prevalent today than it's ever been. And if we're not careful, if we're not on guard, if, if we're not attuned to the effects and, and the, the, the idea that, that this uh, uh, thought springs from, if we are not paying attention, we will likewise end up adopting the philosophy of this other attempt to save the Christian faith. And this other attempt is what's called methodolog methodological pragmatism, pragmatic methods. And so what people who ascribe to this ideology say is, well, we won't alter the core message. We can't do that. But instead, we will adopt different methods of ministry. It's the message it's not the message that people are rejecting. What they are rejecting are the, the methods of ministry that we're using. And so if we change our methods, people will gladly accept the message. And so that gets repeated in this phraseology. Our message doesn't change, but our methods have to change. I want to challenge your assumption on that statement this morning. I've come to believe that that statement is false. Amen. I've come to believe that our methods must not change. And I didn't used to believe that. I will confess to you that I myself have even said that phrase. Our message doesn't change, but our methods have to change to reach this generation. This morning, I'm going to do my best to help you understand why I have changed my thinking on this and why, why, and why I believe that this assumption is equally as destructive as theological liberalism. 
The reason I believe this and have come to believe this, especially over the last two years and what we've been through in the church, is that there are certain methods of, minis- of quote-unquote ministry that are antithetical or in direct opposition to the message of the gospel. I want to say it again. There are certain methods of ministry that are widely adopted and practiced within evangelicalism today, within the church today, that are actually diametrically opposed to the truth that the gospel communicates. Widely accepted by people who reject liberalism, who hold to orthodox Christian beliefs, nevertheless have adopted methods in their ministry that undermine and undercut the gospel message. So let me give you some examples of this. So people in this camp, and I, have, I will confess to you, I was once in this camp. They will say things, and, and, and it, this is how it ends up getting flushed out. We believe in repentance of sin. Amen? But we don't want to offend anybody. And so we don't preach repentance. Again, it's a, it's a methodological issue. We don't want people to be offended. We want when people to come to church. We want them to be happy and to have a nice experience. And if they come and they're confronted on their sin, well, they're not going to be happy. They're not going to have a nice experience. And so, well, of course we believe in repentance. We, we have it in our statement of faith. We have it on our website. But we don't preach repentance because we don't want to offend Here's another example. We believe in the return of Christ. Amen. Amen. That Christ will return and he will judge. I'll use a King James word. He will judge the quick and the dead when he returns. But we won't preach on hell. We believe that Christ will return and that he will judge. And that those who are, are righteous in Christ will enter into eternal glory and and those who have rejected Christ and who have died in their sin and their rebellion against God, that they will be, some will be raised to eternal life and others will be raised, as, as the Bible says, to eternal damnation. But we won't preach that. We hold to orthodox beliefs, but we've adopted methods that undermine the gospel. We believe that Jesus said to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. We believe that. But at every level, we run our ministries and structure our churches in a way that says, it's all about you. It's all about your, how you feel and, and how comfortable you are. And, and we want to make it easy for you to follow Christ even though Jesus said to count the cost. We present the gospel in such a way that there is no counting of the cost. When our Lord Jesus said that people must count the cost before they follow him. That anyone who puts his shoulder to the plow and turns back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. How about this? Well, people don't like to be preached to. You know, people don't like to be preached to today. So we'll stop preaching. Instead, we'll replace the sermon with conversations, with talks. We'll, we'll just, we're just having a conversation here. We're not having a conversation here today. I am declaring to you the truth of God. Amen. If you want to have a conversation, go sit down with Oprah or something. How about, how about this? People don't like preaching. They don't like us being so, you know, you know stingy and, and certain about things. But what do people like today? Well, people like comedy. People like to laugh. So instead of a pastor behind a pulpit preaching... What if he's more like a comedian 
And so let's get a stool on the stage and let's have him tell some jokes for a while and we'll sprinkle a little bit of Christianese on top of it just to make it legal. We'll, we'll reference a Bible verse here and there. How about this? We believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of God. But because we live in a postmodern culture that, that rejects all truth claims, we will not declare propositional truths. Instead, we question the word of God, even from the stage. We no longer have church services where people are served at the table of the Lord to feast on Christ and taught to abide in Him. Instead, those have been replaced with experiences. So you do not come to a church service to be served the bread and the wine. Instead, the bread and the wine have been replaced with smoke and lights. High and lofty speech about Almighty God has been replaced with common language and often the profane. We profess to believe the message but adopt methods that are utterly incompatible with the truths that we claim to believe. This pragmatic method has been packaged and repackaged under many different names. Seeker-sensitive. Church growth movement, attractional. Attracting people to church by giving them an amusing show that boosts their self-esteem when Paul says that he preaches Christ and him crucified, which is foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. These methods are opposed to the message. They undermine the truth that is supposed to be being conveyed. I want you to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. Is this too heavy for us on a holiday weekend? <laughs> Thank you. I hadn't heard that for a few seconds, so I needed to affirm myself. 1 Corinthians 1. See, see the, the, the pragmatist says, well, the, the, this propositional truth claims, de declaring the truth of God, the, the, the culture doesn't have an appetite for that, and, and, and it, it, they don't understand it. it. It seems silly to them, and so we're going to do other things that are, is more culturally acceptable. But here Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Yeah, no doubt. To the, to the world looking on the outside, looking in today, they see what we're doing, and it's utter foolishness. It's utterly ridiculous to them. It's folly to them that are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Skip down to verse 21, second half of verse 21. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand, demand signs and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Men today, in the name of Christ, are devising all kinds of silly schemes to try to attract the world and get them into church. It's foolishness, it's, but the foolishness of God is wiser than the schemes of men. Declaring the truth of God, the word of God, the gospel of God produces fruit. 
On the outside, to the pragmatist, to the, to the purely uh, uh, worldly way of thinking, it seems foolish. But it's the way God has chosen to bring new birth into the hearts of sinners. Notice here Paul destroys both theological liberalism and pragmatic methods when he says that Jews seek after signs and Greeks seek after wisdom. But what do we do? We preach. We preach. That's the method. We preach. And what do we preach? Current events. The news of the day. Cultural trends. No, what do we preach? Christ crucified. There goes theological liberalism. So in this one statement, theological liberalism taken off as an option, how we approach ministry, it's right here. We must proclaim. We must lift up our voice. We must declare truth. We must have the truth settled in our hearts. There's so many so-called ministers today who do not believe the truths of Scripture. They do not believe that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and authoritative. And so they look to the culture for how to communicate to them because they, at the end of the day, they do not trust in the sufficiency of the Word of God to produce fruit in the people's lives who are hearing it. We preach Christ method and message. The underlying assumption on both of these views, they spring forth from the underlying assumption that is the same. Is that people only need to be shown the value of Christianity and then they will gladly accept to follow Christ. That you can convert someone by appealing to their selfish, sinful nature. That's the underlying assumption. But the underlying assumption of the gospel is that not that people don't need to have their minds appealed to, but rather they need to be raised from death unto life. That they are dead in their trespasses and sins, and that the natural man is at enmity with the things of God. That's the underlying assumption of the gospel. But that when the gospel is preached and the gospel is proclaimed that the Spirit of God moves and breathes upon the dead hearts of men, bringing about the new birth, bringing about salvation, bringing about regeneration, producing faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Faith doesn't come by preaching the culture. Faith doesn't come by being culturally relevant. The most relevant message in the world is the gospel message. The most pressing message. And so we cannot present the gospel as, well, you know, it's just an option. And, you know, if you follow Christ, you'll have a good life. And it, Jesus is not one of an option of the buffet items at the golden corral of religion. Jesus is the way. This, this, this truth carries with it a, a, an urgency in the communication method. We cannot communicate these pressing and urgent truths in such a casual manner. It underlines, it, 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 it undercuts, it, it, it removes from the gospel the urgency of repentance and faith towards Christ. Jesus said that we would be hated and despised by all men for his sake. Being rejected by the world is not a bug in the system that we need to fix. We need to stop trying to fix something that is not broken. Amen. Uh, flip back over with me to 1 Timothy uh, quickly this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3. That was my introduction for you this morning. Back to 1 Timothy 3. Verse 14. 
I'm writing these things to you so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. The church of the living God, a pillar and support of the truth. Pragmatism says that when it comes to the church, when it comes to ministry, there is a blank slate. There's a blank slate when it comes to ministry ministry methods, ministry philosophy, ministry methodology. There's a blank slate. We can do what we want as long as we have orthodox beliefs. We could shape the church, mold it into whatever form we want to make it. At the same time, we preach that God has left us instructions on every single area of life. God's left us instructions on how to have relationships and and how to form a family and how to raise children and how to be a good steward of of what he's given you monetarily and, and how to work hard at work and That God's even given us instructions on how the state should be operated and and the authority of the state and the authority of the family institution. And, and, And we think and believe and teach that God left us instructions on all of these other areas. But when it comes to the church and ministry, somehow God didn't write anything down for us. It's absurd. In fact, of the three institutions that God ordained, the state, the family, and the church... The most important of those is the church. Why? Because it's only the church of the living God that is the pillar and support of the truth. It is the church's church's job to uphold the truth. It's the church's job to declare the truth so that the other institutions that God has ordained might operate as he ordained them to operate. And so why do we think that when it comes to the most important institution, the institution that Christ died to redeem, he died for the church, that God left instructions in every other area of life, but when it comes to the church, we just have a blank slate. We do whatever we want. No. I've become convicted that God has ordained biblical methods of ministry that are consistent with the message much of which is found in the pastoral epistles. God ordained, God prescribed methods of ministry. And I'm not talking about whether you send out emails or physical newsletters. You understand that, right? That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about methods. I'm talking about how you do evangelism, how you do discipleship, how you organize and structure your churches, who you appoint as leaders within the church. How you raise people up and send them out. How we accomplish the Great Commission. These are the kinds of methods that we have to make sure are in alignment with what the Word of God has said. Amen. Flip back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I want to give you a quick survey here walking through 1 and 2 Timothy. I want to highlight for you some key words that Paul uses over and over and over again in the pastoral epistles. Again, the idea is that there are God-ordained, God-prescribed, and God-blessed methods of ministry. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So there's purity of doctrine. Right? Okay, theological liberalism. We can't do that. We must hold to the doctrine. The, the, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. But as I go through this, you're going to see that sometimes he's talking about methods and sometimes he's talking about theology. The aim of our charge, verse 5, chapter 1, the aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart. So there's this charge that Paul is entrusting to Timothy. A, a methodology, a philosophy, a way of doing ministry. Chapter uh, 1, verse 18, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you. We've already looked at chapter 3, verse 14. Go to chapter 4, verse 6. This is a more methodological one. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. These things... 
Be trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine which you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. This is, this is methods here he's talking about. Chapter 4, verse 11. Command and teach these things. What do we command? What do we teach? Do we get to just pick? Do we get to just wake up on Saturday morning and say, hmm, I wonder what I would like to preach on today. No, what, we command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set before the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. That's methodological. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, methods, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. What things? These things immerse themselves in you so that all may see your progress. Listen to the stakes that are at hand. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What are the stakes? They are eternal. They are eternal. Chapter 5. Verse 21, I charge you to keep these rules. Chapter 6, verse 2, at the end, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, again, both method and theology, he has puffed up and conceited and understands nothing. How, how long do we do this? Uh, uh, okay, I understand that Paul wrote that for Timothy. He wrote that in Ephesus. How long is this method of ministry binding on the church? We live in the 21st century. We live in the age of Instagram. We live in the age of TikTok. Can't we do TikTok church? Listen to chapter 6, verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. How long are these methods binding on the church? Until Jesus splits the sky wide open. Amen. Amen. And so we must, we must, Hold fast to the preaching of the Word of God. Hold fast to the exposition of Scripture. Hold fast, fast to biblical methods of evangelism where you present the gospel, where you present the bad news, sin, rebellion, breaking of God's law. God is holy and righteous and just. And then the good news, Jesus Christ our Lord who bore our sin and shame and penalty on his back as the substitutionary sacrifice. The victorious bodily resurrection of the dead when Jesus rose on the third day, defeating Satan, sin, and hell. The ascension into heaven where he now sits, rules, and reigns over all mankind. And his imminent return where he will judge the living and the dead. Pure doctrine found in Scripture. We all agree on that. But there are pure methods as well. You want to know how to do ministry in 2022? How do we do ministry now? The world has changed. You won't find the answer in an Amazon bestseller or in the latest blog post or on a YouTube video from an innovative thought leader in the church. You want to know how to do ministry in 2022? You will only find your answer in one place, and it is the word of the true and living God. Amen. Amen. So, for the rest of this morning and tomorrow morning, I've invited some, of, some ministers that believe the word, that teach the word, that preach the word to come and to preach to us about these foundational ministry doctrines and methods. They're going to share the next session on the Great Commission. 
We're going to hear about uh, ministering in the boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to hear about biblical evangelism, biblical discipleship. What makes a church a church? How do we, how do we distinguish the church from the world? How to raise up biblically qualified leaders and how to live a godly and holy life as a minister of the Lord. That's what we're going to focus on for the rest of today and tomorrow morning. Is that a worthwhile endeavor? Amen. The speakers are not going to give you the latest tips and tricks on how to grow your personal brand. They're not going to tell you strategies on how to grow your social media presence. They're not even going to tell you how to grow your church but they are going to preach the word of God. And guess what? They're not, probably not going to tell you something you don't already know. But I pray that as they minister today and tomorrow morning, that you will be encouraged, that you will be built up, that you will be strengthened in your resolve to preach the word and to be unrelenting in your devotion to doing ministry as God has prescribed it to be done. Not taking our cues from the culture or who's popular now on social media, but rather taking our marching orders from the word of God and taking the word to the culture. If you agree with me, would you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the next ministers who are coming up to, to lay these methods before us, to, to challenge us, to call us to a higher way of serving you, of following you. Lord, sharpen us uh, over the next few moments. Uh, bless our time together. I, I pray that you would strengthen our resolve, that you would fill us with courage to be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.